Now, why do I pick out the three men that I have picked out? Kierkegaard for today, Nietzsche for next week, and Sartre for two weeks from tonight. First of all, there are strong reasons for beginning with Kierkegaard, because he is the first unquestionable existentialist. He is the one who started the whole modern movement of existentialism, even though now in retrospect we can look further back and find existentialist features in the thought of Pascal or even St. Augustine or as some people would like to do all the way back in the book of Job. Still, as a philosophic and literary movement, existentialism starts with Kierkegaard. Moreover, Kierkegaard is undoubtedly one of the most commanding and impressive figures of existentialism, and I think of the religious existentialists probably the most remarkable. So he is, to my mind, a particularly good and I would say obvious choice for discussing religious existentialism. The international renown of existentialism is largely due to Jean-Paul Sartre, and I would say that if we look at literary representatives of existentialism, Sartre is probably the outstanding one, the one who in brilliant novels, short stories, plays and essays, as well as philosophic treatises, has brought existentialism to our attention. And here too, in the case of Sartre, just as in the case of Kierkegaard, I am influenced by my considerable respect for the man. Nietzsche was not, as I have already remarked, strictly speaking, in the narrow sense of the word, an existentialist. But I think a good case can be made out for saying that he towers very far indeed above such philosophers as Jaspers and Heidegger, perhaps even to the extent of being the last world historical philosopher, by which I mean that since Nietzsche's time, philosophers have not had a really international impact. A man like Sartre, a man like Jaspers, a man like Heidegger has had very little impact on English-speaking philosophy. On the other hand, the giants of English-speaking philosophy, people like Russell and Moore and John Dewey and William James, have had hardly any impact in the non-English-speaking world on continental European thought. Nietzsche is, I think, the last great philosopher in whom we find impulses and tendencies that have been influential and crucially important for philosophy almost everywhere. So I pick him too because he seems to me to be of unusual stature. To wind up then these introductory remarks, I would say that I happen to be, as some of you know, critical of existentialism, but the point of this series of three lectures will not be to tear down existentialism. It will not be to try to show how foolish it all is. And that is why I have picked three men to whom in various ways, although I am critical of them here or there, I do look up. And what I want to do is to try to increase your understanding as best I can not only of these three men, but also of existentialism, and beyond that, of some aspects of the modern world, of three crises in particular, of issues that concern all of us, and perhaps here and there I may be able to make some constructive suggestions. Now let us begin with Kierkegaard. I propose to approach him somewhat differently from the way he is usually approached. I think he himself would have said that the usual approach to his thought is, in his own peculiar use of that word, aesthetic. When Kierkegaard speaks of an aesthetic approach, or an aesthetic orientation, 
What he means is that one is a spectator, that one looks at something that is outside oneself, that one observes without becoming involved in it. An extreme form of an aesthetic attitude would be if you collapse in front of your TV set and just try to be entertained. But that would not be the only example of an aesthetic attitude. The attitude would remain aesthetic, the way Kierkegaard uses the term, as long as you make no commitment, as long as you yourself do not become deeply involved. And I dare say that most current interpretations of and most current interest in Kierkegaard is of this aesthetic nature, that he is a terribly interesting person. Being interesting would be, in Kierkegaard's peculiar use of the term, an aesthetic category. It's interesting, it's fascinating, just look at it. Secondly, people usually look at Kierkegaard by way of pointing out that he was very critical of the German philosopher Hegel. And since there's hardly anybody who is not very critical of Hegel, if he talks about Hegel at all, this too is not very distinctive. To say he is interesting, to say he hates Hegel's guts, this really doesn't set him apart. Almost everybody does. Thirdly, people usually present Kierkegaard as if he had been something of an apologist, either an apologist for Christianity or preferably a sort of non-denominational apologist for religion, somebody who sort of fits into the current scene as one of the many people who are, of course, as who is not in favor of religion. In all three respects, my approach to Kierkegaard is very different. First of all, it's not aesthetic, but existential. Instead of just saying, now, isn't he a beautiful writer? Doesn't he put things quaintly? Isn't this a nice book? I will say, isn't this a maddening book? Isn't this something that is meant to upset us? Kierkegaard uses deliberately the uh, word that is found in the epistles of Paul, Scandalon, a scandal, a stumbling block, an outrage, something that is upsetting. Kierkegaard wants to upset us, and I will try to emphasize elements in his thought that are upsetting. This takes me to the second point. Instead of claiming that he criticized Hegel, which he certainly did, I will say that he criticized Hegel and Hegelianism because philosophers in his time, for the most part, were Hegelians, but that he really criticized philosophy quite generally, and that if he had lived in our time, instead of picking on poor old Hegel, I'm sure he would have picked on pragmatism, or he would have picked on uh, logical positivism, or analytic philosophy, any kind of philosophy, indeed beyond philosophy, he would have criticized our trust in reason, our trust in science. This is something that is, to the modern mind, somewhat outrageous, but this is something that has to be brought out. And finally, very far from being an apologist for Christianity or for religion, somebody who tries to make it palatable, Kierkegaard wore himself out in trying to denounce people who sought to make religion and Christianity in particular palatable and insisted that it is not palatable, but that it is absolutely absurd, that it's outrageous to the human reason, that it might even outrage our moral sense, and that nevertheless it should be accepted. In other words, his conception of religion, once it is understood, I think, is seen not to fit at all into the current revival of religion, but on the contrary, Kierkegaard, if he were living today, I'm sure, would be a particularly outspoken and radical critic of the kind of religion that is flourishing today. And this wants to be brought out if one wants to do justice to the man who said of himself in what is perhaps one of the nicest passages of his writings, that when he was about 30, one day he sat in the park and he said to himself, here I am 30 years old and what have I done? Very, very little. 
Here are so many great men in our time and they all have done so much and I have done so little. And then he thought about it and he decided that what all these men were doing to the best of their ability was to make life easier. And that he himself had no talent for making life easier and so he resolved to make things more difficult. I think that's a lovely passage in the concluding unscientific postscript, how Kierkegaard resolves to make things more difficult. And one doesn't do justice to him and his heritage if one talks about him for an hour in a lecture, if one doesn't bring out this crucial element that he is somebody who related himself to Socrates because he too wanted to be a gadfly. He too wanted to make things difficult. Now let me very quickly fill in some data about his life. He was born in 1813 and he died in 1855 and he lived almost all his life in Denmark, specifically in Copenhagen, though he briefly studied also at the University of Berlin. His father was a very strict and rigid authoritarian, a very pious man, who was bothered by the fact that once, when he had been very poor as a young boy, he had out on the heather cursed God. And this bothered not only the father, but it also bothered the son very deeply. Kierkegaard also remembers how his father wouldn't uh, allow him much to go outdoors, but said uh, there's no need to go outdoors. Perhaps this had something to do with the fact that the boy, Zuren Kierkegaard, was somewhat crippled, somewhat misshapen. Perhaps that was why the father didn't want him to go out too much. The father said, we can take a walk in this room. We can just walk up and down together. And as they walked up and down together for perhaps half an hour at a time, the father described what they saw castles in Spain and he described them in such great detail everything that they saw and with such painstaking and vivid imagination that after about half an hour the boy was all worn out from so much experience and as exhausted as if he had been playing ball for hours. This greatly stimulated his imagination but also made him something very peculiar, somewhat solipsistic, somebody who could sort of after a while just stay by himself and imagine all sorts of things without ever actually coming into contact with other people. Then one day it seemed to the young boy that there was strong evidence that his father had seduced his mother before they were married when the father's first wife had died and when the second wife-to-be was still a maid in his house and that he, Zuren Kierkegaard, was probably begotten before his father and mother were married. And when he found this out, he was so shocked because his father had seemed such a pious and such a moral man that it would seem that just once he debauched himself, he went to a brothel, something of that sort, and then afterwards kept thinking about the relation between the sins of the fathers and the sins of the children, how somehow the father's sin was connected, as it obviously was psychologically in his case, with the sin of the son, who when he finds out about the father's sin, does something himself, it is sinful, and this set him to brooding about original sin. Not that he wouldn't have thought about that anyway, but there was this vivid personal connection in, this, uh, in his mind. 